Importance of Palm Sunday. Uh, John chapter 12. Now, first, it transits. There's a transition from Jesus' public ministry to a private ministry with his disciples. And that's the first thing. In uh, John 2 to 11, it's all about Jesus' signs, wonders. He's the public ministry. He's teaching the people. You know, in the book of Matthew, etc., he was giving the Sermon on, on the Mount. So that's his public ministry. But after this Palm Sunday, he shifts now to a private ministry with his disciples. And of course, eventually to the cross. So, it's only one week now, I mean, less than a week before he is put on the cross. So, it's a very private time. And Palm Sunday is that transition point. The second point is, on Palm Sunday, uh, it mentions the long-awaited and much-mentioned hour. You know, Jesus said, you know, my, my hour has not come. In the, in the uh, miracle at Cana where he, Mary wants him to perform a miracle or something, he says, ah, woman, don't you know my hour has not come? So it's talking about his hour. And when they try to sort of kill him, uh, he said, uh, my hour has not come. They could not do anything to him because his hour had not come. But on Palm Sunday, his hour has come. All right. Third point, it transits from signs and wonders uh, in the, from John chapter 2 to 11 and all the ministry in Matthew, Mark and Luke about signs and he's healing people. But Palm Sunday, when his hour has come, the whole thing shifts to the glory of the cross and we will look into that point. So there are three important points we need to look at Palm Sunday. Right? And so now we will look into these points, you will find it woven into the sermon. Now in John chapter 12, when we look at this particular chapter, we will divide it into three parts. The first part is Verses 1 to 11, the importance of Mary's anointing of Jesus. Now, this Mary is specifically mentioned as the sister of Lazarus and Martha. Right? There was another woman or uh, someone else or whatever, but this Mary is the one that anoints uh, and is mentioned as Lazarus' sister and Martha's sister. So that's the first point, verses 1 to 11. The second thing is the importance of Palm Sunday, the triumphant entry of Jesus to Jerusalem. That is verses 12 to 19. And the third one is very subtle, but very important. And the importance of the Greeks that visit. I mean, only one verse. The Greeks come, they want to see Jesus, and then they move away from the scene. But it's so important, as we will see, because that signals to Jesus that his hour has come. Right? That is verses 20 to 36. So let us start with the first point, the importance of Mary's anointing. Now, I am not going to bring the scriptures because I would have to read the whole chapter. And so, you know, on the... So, you would have, if you have got your Bibles, take it out, iPhones or whatever, and have a look at the scriptures. I'm, but I'm going to read it. Now, first point. You know, okay. Six days before the Passover, Jesus arrived at Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus has raised from the dead. Six days. That was Saturday, Friday night, Saturday. He came, right? He came to Bethany. He had gone out to, because there was a tense situation. And if you read uh, John chapter 11, um, 
uh, verses 53 and 54. It says over there, from that day onwards, they plotted to take his life. Which, which day? From the time he raised up Lazarus from the dead. They wanted to take his life. And so he withdrew outside Jerusalem. But six days before the Passover, Jesus comes again into Jerusalem. Right? So, now, he enters the home of Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. And a dinner was too. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Now verse 3. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Now, let us continue. But one of his disciples, that is Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why, was, why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was a year's wages. Now, he did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief, as keeper of the money bag. He used to help himself to what was put into it. Now, actually, this remark by John is in hindsight. I mean, he wrote this letter, he wrote this gospel after Judas betrayed Jesus, after Jesus was crucified, after Jesus rose from the dead. So in hindsight, he has written this. But at that time, nobody knew that Judas was a thief, right? And he just made this remark. Hey, okay. Now, Mary anoints Jesus with a pint. It's half a liter. This is half a liter. Right? So much. And in the Gospel of Mark, you will see that Mary poured it on Jesus' head. And Jesus himself said his whole body was with this perfume. And she went down in John chapter 12, she went down on her knees and wiped his feet uh, with her hair. That's the situation. Okay? Half a pint. Now, this half a pint cost 300 denarii. It was one year's wages. So how much is one year's wages? How, how am I going to calculate one year's wages in today's, in today's time? I'm thinking, so one year's wages? Well, anyway, we know that in John chapter 6, verse 7, when Jesus feeds about 5,000 men, so it might be even more than 5,000 uh, people, but if you take the minimum, 5,000 men, and he feeds them, and Philip says, look, where are we going to get this money for this 5,000 people? Eight months' wages will not be sufficient. Eight months. So I'm thinking that if you are going to feed 5,000 people with, you know, idli vada, right, uh, sambar, okay, how much would it cost one dish? And I'm just calculating, so there's a calculation. So I think probably 25 to 30 rupees for a dish, because they had a lot. They had everybody, you know, 25, 30 rupees, and then you get the math, you know, and remember this is eight months wages, so 12 months would be far more. Then it comes to about two lakhs, minimum. Two lakhs. Two lakhs for this. Right? Two lakhs for this. 200,000 rupees. For this, for this amount of perfume, okay? So, now, Judas betrayed Jesus for how much? For 30 pieces of silver. Now, this is 300 pieces of silver. Denarii is a silver coin. 300 pieces of silver. Judas betrays Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. 30 pieces of silver is the price for a slave, which is given in Exodus. How much would you pay for a slave? 30 pieces. Judas betrays Jesus for 30 pieces. One tenth that Mary poured out of devotion on Jesus. Right? 
So it gives you an understanding of Mary's devotion. It gives you an understanding of Judas' betrayal for a pittance. And then we would apply it to ourselves as we go further. Now, you know, have you ever seen a bottle of attar, you know, the, what the Muslims have? It's a so small bottle. Huh? And you try and put two drops on you, I'm telling you the whole day you will smell, next day you will smell, even after a week you can't get your clothes out of that smell of attar. You know that? I want to, this is truth. This is really truth. Can you imagine one bottle of strong, expensive perfume poured out? If you take one small bottle of attar and put on you, I can tell you this whole place is going to smell. You agree? Right? Such a small bottle. Can you see the most expensive perfume? One bottle like this, half a liter, poured out on Jesus' whole body. Of course, the whole room would be having that fragrance, but what touches my heart is this. That fragrance did not leave Jesus because he went to the upper room, he had the last supper, and then he went to the cross. And I can tell you one thing, that fragrance still lingered on him. It still lingered. That is Mary's devotion. That is her devotion. And that devotion touches me. It touched Jesus. But you see, another thing about that devotion she wiped Jesus' feet with her hair. You know, women at those days were conservative. They would not just lose their hair in front of a man. You, you understand? But she, whatever bun she was wearing, she loosened it. And she wiped with abandonment. That without shame, without fear of criticism, she did it. Ah, oh, man, that's devotion. That is devotion. Then, I think to myself, she did it because she knew that Jesus was going to die. She was the first person that came to know that Jesus was going to go on the cross and die. I mean, the others thought about it, but they said, eh, it might be not so. And so, but she was the first. And she was the first one to wipe Jesus' feet with the hair. I, I'm thinking that, you know, soon after Jesus goes to the upper room and he washes his disciples' feet. He himself washes his disciples' feet. And the disciples said, no, 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 don't touch my feet. No, 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 no. But you see, Mary already knows Jesus' heart. She knows Jesus' heart. She senses that he is going to die on the cross. She senses his death and she senses his ministry that it is better to serve others. She washed his feet. She senses his ministry. Ah, And I think to myself, you know, when we are ignored in ministry, we get so uptight. Oh, I should have been doing this and you got that. And if you are here to be a naukar, you know what's a naukar? Naukar is a what? Servant. Don't make nakra. You understand? Don't make nakra. If you are here to be a servant, don't make nakra because that nakra does. Nakra means, you know what? Drama. You know, nakra means what? Drama. Don't, don't make. Serve, serve. Because you want, you and I both want our service to linger. As a fragrance on Jesus. You understand that? Right? Like Mary. Mary's fragrance. Mary's anointing. It's Jesus could smell that devotion even on the cross. Even on the cross. It never left him. And our devotion should be like that. It should touch Jesus. We should walk the extra mile, whatever is our calling in life. Whether you're a businessman, whether you're a worship leader, or a singer, or a 
in the service team or an evangelist or whatever. Serve him without nakra. You understand? Serve him and he is worth it. He is worth it. And so the importance of Mary's anointing touches my heart. It touched Jesus' heart, by the way, because that fragrance even was on the cross. That fragrance did not leave him. You understand? That fragrance did not leave him. So, we come to the second point. The second point is the importance of Palm Sunday. The triumphant entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. That is verses 12 to 19. So I'm reading it out. The next day, the crowd that had come for the feast heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. Jesus arrived in Bethany six days before the Passover, probably on Saturday. Next day is Sunday. This is Palm Sunday. He entered Jerusalem. Right? And the people knew that he is coming, so they were charged up. Now, Jerusalem, you know, it wasn't a big city. It was probably as big as Cockstown. And the population at that time was 50,000 people, approximately. But during the three major festivals of Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles, the Jews from all over Israel came for their pilgrimage to Jerusalem. So Jerusalem was packed, maybe three times over, maybe four times over. Some people say it was minimum 150,000 people. Some people say it was 200,000. Some historians say it was one million people. Oh man, that's big. No, I don't know, but certainly it was packed. Now, when it was packed like that, you see, the police, the temple authorities, all must be quite nervous. You know, they don't want any uprising. Because, you see, the, the, the Jews never liked uh, Roman occupation. You know, uh, the Jews felt that Israel was their land. Till today, they feel that way. God-given land. So they didn't want someone to rule over them. So there were plenty of people that wanted to overthrow the Romans. So the, everybody was tense when everybody, you know, with such a big crowd came into Jerusalem. It was a tense time. And add to it, this Messiah is coming to Jerusalem. And the people were excited because just a few days ago, just a week ago, he raised up, raised up Lazarus from the dead. Man, they were bonkers. They wanted to see this Messiah. So you, can you imagine the charged up atmosphere in Jerusalem? Charged up. Okay? You must know that. Now, they welcomed Jesus with palm, date palm leaves. Now, let me tell you, this date palm leaves was not just an agricultural offering. It wasn't. It was, the palm tree was a symbol of Jewish nationalism. Okay? It was a symbol of Jewish nationalism. And waving these date palm leaves was really making a political statement that we want you as our king. We want you as our deliverer. They were making a political statement with that. And so they cried out. That is from Psalm 118, verse 25 to 26. Mind you, they said, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But then they added something else. That is not given in the Psalms. He says, blessed is the king of Israel. You see, they're making a political statement. Yeah, you're coming in the name of the Lord. But yeah, you're going to deliver us from these Roman guys. They wanted that type of Messiah. Okay? And that you'll soon find out that's exactly what they wanted. 
So, Jesus comes riding on what? On a donkey. That's a statement that Jesus makes. Of course, he's fulfilling the prophecy given in Zechariah, but the disciples even didn't know that. So I'm going to read out. Verse 14, Jesus found a young donkey and sat upon it. As it is written, don't be afraid, O daughter of Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a colt. That's a very important thing. We will go through it later. At first, the disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize these things had been written about him. So they didn't understand that. But Jesus is making a statement. I'm not coming on a war horse. Conquerors come not on a donkey. They come on a war horse. You understand? Now, this is the first coming of Jesus. He comes, as, he comes on a donkey. But the second coming, he won't come on a donkey. He will come on a horse. Okay? The second coming. But the first coming, he comes on a donkey. Donkey is a sign of peace. He comes in a sign of peace. And so, and then, he, that first verse, this first part, don't be afraid. That's not given in Zechariah. That's given in Zephaniah. Don't be afraid. He's saying, look, I have not come to raise up this, you know, fight against the Romans and all. Take it easy, man. Take it easy. Don't be afraid. Calm down. I've come in peace. I've come in peace. So, Go into uh, Zechariah chapter 9, verses 9 and 10. You'll see something. So it's not given up there, but we look into it. Okay. Yeah. Zechariah, verses 9, 9 and 10. He says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you righteous and having salvation. Gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Listen, I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. He will rule the sea. He will, his rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. He comes as a prince of peace. He doesn't come to bring war. In fact, he breaks the instruments of war. He breaks them and he brings peace. This is our Lord Jesus. Now, he comes that way on Palm Sunday. Into, uh, and when he comes, in verse 19, the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look, the whole world has gone after him. That is a, probably a statement of despair. The whole world is going after him. Hey, but that's why Jesus came. Why was he sent? For God so loved the world. Jesus came to save the world. And so the Pharisees, unknowingly, and even with the wrong heart, is stating a truth. He has come so that the world will come to him. Right? Of course, yeah, that's ironic. So let us now go to the next thing. The third point. The third point is the Greeks, the importance of the Greeks' visit. So verse 20, now there were some Greeks amongst those who went up to worship at the feast. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with the request, Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Now, who were these Greeks? They came to the festival. They were the God-fearing people. You know, there were God-fearing Gentiles. One of them was Cornelius. He was a God-fearing man. All right? And so, you know, he came to faith later on. These were God-fearing, Greek-speaking people. Whether they were Greeks, whether they were not Greek, but they were Greek-speaking people. And about 20,000 
of them were living in Galilee. That's where Philip comes from. And Philip, his name is not Hebrew. His name is a Greek name. So there was a kindred spirit. So he, they approached Philip. And they said, we would like to see Jesus. Of course, Philip came and told Andrew. And Andrew came with Philip. They both went to see Jesus and tell him about it. Jesus gets a signal. Now, Jesus is important. Because he doesn't, he doesn't go to see the Greeks. But this is what his response is. Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Oh, this Greek guy wants to see Jesus. Hour has come. That's the signal for Jesus. So what does it mean? What does it mean? You see, this word, the Greeks want to see Jesus. Remember, the first disciples, when they saw Jesus, what, he, what did they tell? Lord, where are you staying? He said, come and see. They had a heart to follow Jesus. They were attracted to Jesus. That's the first disciples. Right? They wanted to be with Jesus. These Greeks also wanted the same thing. So there should be an emphasis on the word see. We would like to see Jesus. That word see by these God-fearing Greeks is just not out of curiosity. You know, it shouldn't be read that way. They were God-fearing Greeks. They came to the temple to worship with the Jews. Of course, they were not allowed inside the temple courts. They had a separate court known as the courts of the Gentiles. And these God-fearing Gentiles was in that court. They had a heart for the God of Israel. And in that heart, they wanted to see Jesus means they wanted to get to know him with a view of following him. And then these are the other sheep. You remember Jesus says when he, in John, I think, yeah, in the story of the good shepherd, he says, I've got other sheep. And one day there will be what? You know, one flock. Okay, one shepherd and one flock. These were the other sheep. The people from the Gentiles. Jesus all the time had ministered to the Jews with the exception of the Samaritan. And the Samaritans were in any case half Jewish. But otherwise he really didn't go to the, to the Gentiles. There was a Canaanite woman who came there. But he didn't have a ministry. He had his ministry only to the Jews. He says, I've come for the lost sheep of Israel. But now these other sheep are coming. And that signals something. He says, the hour has come. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. That's the hour. Now is the time, you know, the Son of Man will be glorified. And so... So how does this thing work, this glory work? What does he mean for the Son of Man to be glorified? Okay. Here he makes a law. The law of the kingdom. The law of the glory. And so let us look at that law because it applies to you and me. It says here, I tell you the truth. I mean, this is the Greeks come. Jesus says, signals, the hour has come. And then he says this, one after the other. He says, I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. The man who loves his life, a man who loves his life will lose it in this world. Sorry, let me see reading. Really. The man who loves his life will lose it, while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, my servant also will be. My father will honor the one who serves me. Well, Greeks come. Our has come. Jesus gives us the law of the kingdom. By the way, this law of the kingdom is given in all the Gospels. All. It's the law of the kingdom. Okay? And he says, 
I have to die. And when I die, I will give, it will be much fruit. Until I die, I can't bear fruit. It will be only a single seed. But I have to die. I will rise up again. I will rise up again. And I will give much fruit. And he says, you have to do the same thing. That's the law of the kingdom. There's a difference between our death and his death. He rises up again and gives us life. We have to die to this world. Every day, take up our cross. Jesus died on the cross. He died. He rose up again. And by his Holy Spirit, he's moving and giving life to the world. We embrace the cross. Unless you deny yourself, take up your cross daily and follow me. You cannot be my disciple. Right? Every day, we have to deny ourselves. Deny ourselves means don't give in to carnality, to the things of this world. Don't give in to carnality. Embrace the cross. The cross life. Not my will, but thy will be done. And then you enter by that way into the resurrection power of the Lord. You enter. Paul was saying, I embrace the fellowship of suffering. That somehow I might enter. Somehow I might enter into his resurrection power. If you want, that's the law of the kingdom. None of us can, can bypass that law. None of us can bypass the cross. None of us means no believers. Of course, if you're an unbeliever, you can bypass the cross. It doesn't matter at all. You're part of the world. But if you're a believer, you have to embrace the cross. And that's the law of the kingdom. And, and then he says, now, now my heart is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. This is, you know, the Gospel of John doesn't talk about Gethsemane. But he brings the spirit of Gethsemane in this place. Not my will, but thy will be done. He brings that point over here. He says, my heart is troubled. I am in anguish. I mean... If this cup could pass away from me, let it pass, but not my will, but thy will be done. That's what he's saying over here. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. This is the hour. This is what I was born for. This is what I came into this world for. To die and to give my life that others may have life and have it in abundance. But that's a resurrection life. Not the carnal life, the resurrection life, the life of Christ, and that's the abundant life. He says, Father, glorify your name. You see, when you work, when you operate by embracing the cross and operating in the resurrection life, God is glorified. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. Of course, the Father has glorified it, His name. How? By sending Jesus in the incarnation that revealed His heart for us. You see, what is His glory? His glory is His heart. The beautiful heart of God. Of course, it is His power. Of course, it is His light. But the core of it is the beautiful heart of God. He revealed it by first sending His Son in the incarnation for us. And then, he also revealed his heart by the words that came from Jesus' words, from Jesus' mouth, and by the signs and wonders in his name. Jesus was the exact image, ra radiance of God's glory. Exact. And he spoke the very words of his Father, the very, very words of his Father into this world. And that way he glorified God, his Father. But I will glorify it again. 
What more? The cross. I'm going to glorify it again on the cross. I've glorified it in the past, and I will glorify it again when Jesus goes on the cross. Now, the crowd heard it. It says over here in verse 29. The crowd heard it. But Jesus says, that was not for my benefit. I already know it. It's for your benefit. <laughs> That's for your benefit. Uh-huh. That we should understand these principles. He says, for your. And then he says in verse 31, now, now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. Now. Now, the cross is now. The cross gives life to those who embrace it, but it brings judgment on those who don't want it. All right? There are only two kingdoms, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of this world. You can't go in between. 50-50, no chance. All right? Kingdom of God, kingdom of the world, and the cross separates these two kingdoms. Huh? Separates these two kingdoms. And there is judgment on the kingdom of Satan. Judgment. But when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to myself. He's talking about, look, when I am lifted up, he's talking about the cross. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. See, the cross, the cross, the cross is the glory of our Lord Jesus, his heart for, for mankind. Of course, he doesn't remain on the cross. He is resurrected later. But the cross life, my dear brothers and sisters, is when God is glorified. It's the cross life that will draw people unto him. All right? Now, this was too much. This was too much for all the people. Uh, this was too much. But for us, every day, you see, there's either a kingdom of God or a kingdom of Satan. And every day we must align ourselves with the kingdom of God. Daily, embrace the cross. Daily, deny yourself. Daily, the word daily is there. Every day. Every day, we, as we come into our private devotions. We align ourselves, even in our worship, we align ourselves. It's just not singing songs to Christ. It's just not exalting His name. But it's embracing His values. It's also embracing the cross life. If you don't embrace the cross life and sing your songs, it is hypocrisy. It is hypocrisy. So every day, when you go before God every day, in our times of personal devotion, we say, Jesus, I love you, but I love your cross. I embrace your cross. And every day, we bring our sins before him, repent, and say, God, I'm sorry. Oh, I, oh my gosh, my tail feathers were standing up when I was dealing with that person. Ah. I was, oh, I was showing my carnality. I was showing this, I was showing that, and I'm sorry. He says, okay, done. I'll forgive you. But every day we say, God, I will follow you. I will embrace the cross life. Every day, you know, it's a daily, dip, daily thing. And every day we align ourselves that way in worship, and every day we align ourselves with the word of God and say, God, let your word be a sword inside my heart. Cut between soul and spirit. Cut between the carnality and the things of God inside me. We got mixtures inside. All of us. And let the word of God cut between soul and spirit. And every day we spend time with God. We align ourselves with the kingdom of God every day. Right? But of course, this was too much for the unbelievers. They wanted Jesus the King, not the one that would speak death to their hearts 
And so they couldn't understand. And the rest of the chapter is, is just that they can't understand Jesus. And Jesus makes a last ditch attempt. Last ditch. He said, look, in verse 35, then Jesus told them, you are going to have the light just a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, for darkness overtakes you. The man who walks in the dark does not know where he is going. Put your trust in the light while you have it, so that you may become sons of light. And in verse later on, he says, when he had finished speaking, Jesus left and hid himself from them. His appeal even is valid today. He's saying, look, this is the time of your salvation. If you haven't given your life, here is the time you can give because I will pass by one day. You won't find me. I will pass by. And so if the Lord appeals to those Jews, but of course, they didn't want him. They crucified him. But he's appealing to us. He's appealing to you and me. He's appealing to you. He said, look, I'm appealing to you. One day I will pass by. I will pass by. But today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Today is the day of your salvation. Your name, your name is victory. All praise will rise to Christ our King. Your name, your name is victory. Our praise will rise to Christ our King.